Hi, good morning. Welcome to service. If this is your first time joining our online service, um, welcome to Kingdom City Church. My name is Joanne. I'm the ministry director here. And before we get into our service, we just like to go over a few announcements so that you guys are updated. Um, immediately after service, we're going to have Kathy DeDrama pray for anyone who needs prayer or has any prayer requests. You can reach her at kathydedrama at gmail.com um, via Google Hangouts or FaceTime. Um, she'll be available about an hour after service. Um, we are collecting our online, on our online tithing on our mobile app uh, on Tithely. Uh, it's a free download that you can um, just give your donations or offering to. Um, you just need to look for our church name, Kingdom City Church, and then our location, Rochelle Park, New Jersey. Um, we are currently taking donations still for COVID relief. Um, so please feel free to donate there. You can just change the tab to donations instead of a general fund. The general fund is our um, our normal tithes. Um, as far as updates for the week, we do not have uh, small groups or midweek service currently. Um, once that comes back up and running, I will inform you guys uh, in an un another announcement or another email. Um, thank you for joining our service today. Good morning, Kingdom City Church. Welcome to worship this morning. Today we have a special guest, Stephanie, who's going to join us in worship. Hello. Um, and today as we just begin in a call to worship, I would love to turn our attention to the book of Lamentations, um, chapter 3, verses 22 um, and 23. Uh, this is a really famous passage in scripture, um, but I love it because it reminds us that every day is a new day. Every day is a day that we can sing of God's faithfulness and his goodness. Um, and so if you guys turn your Bibles with me, or if it's projected up on the screen, um, Lamentations 3, verses 22 to 23, it says this. It says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Amen. Um, this morning as we begin our time of worship, I want to invite us just to pray and just to remember God's faithfulness, remember his goodness. Uh, I know that not always in every circumstance uh, is his is his goodness and his faithfulness apparent or is it obvious? Um, but we believe that the Lord works all things to the good of those who love him, even the things that seem bad, um, even the things that seem difficult. And when we look back, we see that God was there. We see that God was faithful and that he had a good plan in mind. And so um, let's turn our attention to him. Um, even in the midst of a lot of tragedy that happened this past week, um, let's come to the Lord and trust in him and who he is more than our circumstance, more than the tragedy, more than any promise that this world gives. Let's trust in him. Let's pray. so much for for this church and for the way that you've used us 
God, I pray that you would um, bless this time of worship that we have. Uh, bless this time that we can come to you in community and in oneness. God, I pray that this church would be a safe space for us to worship you uh, and that we would find you in your presence, God. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.
Jesus, we pray that as we continue in worship, God, that our hearts would have no other gods, no other idols but Jesus. That, Lord, we wouldn't look for our own happiness as our God, that we wouldn't look to the things that we think are important apart from you as our gods. But Jesus, that you would help us as a church get back to the heart of worship, that you would help us get back to the thing that matters. And Jesus, it's all about you. So help us as a church abide and rest and be just where you are. Help us to love you more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. And Jesus, be the center of it all. And Jesus, be the center of it all. So 
Jesus be the center of your church and Jesus be the center of your church and every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess you Jesus Jesus Nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center. church, despite whatever we go through, can proclaim that you are the center, you are the one thing that everything else revolves around. Lord, from the beginning of our lives to the end, God, there won't be a single more important thing than exalting and loving the name of Jesus. God, I thank you that from the beginning of my life, Lord, before I even knew it, God, that you were there, that you loved me, and that you had a plan laid out for my life a plan to redeem me, a plan to love me, a plan to make um, yourself known in my life. God, I thank you. And I pray that we as a church would remember you all the more, that we would love to be with you all the more, that we would love one another all the more. So thank you, God. I pray that you bless the service today, and you, you know, that you bless Pastor Josh and his words, um, and his spirit as he preaches. Um, be with our church. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, my name is Pastor Sunita Ponton from Metro Community Church in Englewood, New Jersey. I'm so excited to be sharing with you this morning, Kingdom City Church. Um, I am grateful to your pastor and please know that I am praying along with you and um, Pastor Josh and his entire family during this time. So let us pray together. Almighty God, our Father, I thank you um, for this opportunity to share your word with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have a word for us today. And so now, God, I have um, prepared as best I know how. I have prayed over this text, but you must preach it. I have um, studied your word, Lord God, but you must um, send your Holy Spirit that speaks um, not only to me, but speaks to your people through technology, God. And I have written words on paper, but God, I ask that you would write them on our hearts that we might be faithful to you in seasons of, um, of pain and of waiting, God. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, and all God's children, wherever you are, amen. To say that we are in tumultuous times right now seems to be an understatement. We are living in the time of two pandemics, COVID-19 and what I like to call racism 1619, but I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Sometimes I have to sit back and chuckle. This is not at all what we thought 2020 would be like. We were all so excited about this new decade. Each new year seems to bring a time of great hope. We're turning a new page, we're starting a new chapter in our lives. We are hitting the restart button, but I can tell you 
for all the 2020 visioning we did, we did not see this. We are, were all blindsided. I chuckle because perhaps we all need glasses and for some of us, maybe a new prescription. But then a pastor friend of mine suggested that maybe God's vision of 2020 is actually to expose and to get us to see more clearly who we really are, who we've become as a society and to really examine our values. COVID-19 hit and we're faced with asking ourselves, which is more important, the health and safety of people or saving the economy? Many of us realize that we have been neglecting our families. Many of us realize that we have been neglecting our spiritual lives. COVID-19 showed us what's important. Then racism 1619 came along. I call it racism 1619 because the year 1619 is the year the first slave ship was brought to the United States, thus beginning a condition that would affect and infect all of us. While the world has no other option, people are finally paying attention to what many people of color and some white people have been saying for decades, if not for centuries, racism kills. The way people of color have been treated in this country is evil and sinful, whether it's slavery, the near extinction of, extinction of Native Americans, Japanese internment, or police brutality. For some, all that COVID-19 and racism 1619 brings with it has shaken their faith. Illness, death, fear, isolation, unemployment, homeschooling, fractures in marriages and other family relationships you can no longer hide because for so long there was nowhere else to go. And even as our worlds begin to open up a bit more, we enter this new season of wondering what we're actually opening up to. What will this new world be like? We're waiting to see what will happen. Will schools resume? Will COVID cases get better? When will I get back to work as usual? We're waiting for certainty. There is still police brutality and some have been waiting for decades to see justice. There are still killings, harassment, dismissals, and turning away. When will it end? When will we see justice in our land for people of color? When will we actually start loving one another the way we should? We're waiting for a change. So today, I want us to look at a woman who demonstrates to us how to maintain faith, even during hardship and while we're waiting. Whether you've been waiting 13 weeks for a post-COVID world, years for the spouse of your dreams, months for children, or all of your life for justice, this woman can teach us how to wait well. She can teach us how to remain faithful to God, even in the midst of heartache and waiting. Today, we will talk about Hannah. Hannah stands out as a heroine of our faith because of her deep faith in the midst of intense heartache and waiting. When we look at the history of Israel, we see that it was Hannah's intimate relationship with God and her faith that turned the tide for the people of Israel. Through Hannah's faithfulness in her face of her own personal pain, she would give birth to a son, and her son Samuel would be the transitional figure between the judges and the kings. Samuel would be a priest and a prophet to King Saul and David, desperately trying to keep them on track with God. But even more than a mother, Hannah is worth our attention because of her deep faith and heartfelt prayer while enduring so much heartache and waiting. She never gave up on God. And that's what makes her a heroic woman of faith and a great teacher for us needing to know how to wait well. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. There was a certain man from Ramathim, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Amapha, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and could not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? 
don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to the home of Rama. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Hannah finds herself as part of a line of women unable to have children like Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel before her. As we read the Bible, we see that infertile women are often a signal that they are going to bring forth a child of great importance to God's kingdom. Their infertility is highlighted not for their physical lack, but for God's awesome power and sovereignty. Sarah would bear Isaac, Rebecca would give birth to Jacob, Rachel would have Joseph, and later Elizabeth would become the mother of John the Baptist. But just like the other women, Hannah would face deep pain and distress before finally becoming a mother. Hannah is miserable. She is barren. As you may know, during this time, a woman's value was bound up in her ability to have children, particularly male children. They would be the heirs for her husband and the ones who would care for her if she outlived her husband. Barrenness was ridiculed. Hannah was vulnerable to the expectations of others, as well as her own internal feelings of failure and inadequacy. It caused her to weep and to stop eating. This was deeply painful for her, and to make matters worse, she was provoked by her husband's second wife, Peninnah, the wife presumably brought on to fulfill the duty she could not. Can you imagine? You're not a good cook, so your husband marries a second wife so that he, she could cook for him? Well, maybe some of you don't mind if somebody else comes in and does the cooking and the cleaning. But for Hannah, this second wife added to her misery. Hannah knew why she was there. That was bad enough. But Peninnah, probably out of her own pain of knowing that she was not the loved wife, provoked and teased Hannah, gloating about her children and ridiculing Hannah because of her condition. Hannah was broken. The weight of societal pressure, the pain of a broken heart, the misery of an unfulfilled dream. I have friends who struggle with infertility. For my friends, having their menstrual cycle return month after month is like a dagger to the heart. Can you imagine the pain Hannah must have endured? There really are no words. Have you ever been in a situation that has caused you this much pain? Has something troubled you so deeply that your heart actually hurts? That you don't just cry, but you sob and the, the pain wells up from somewhere deep inside you didn't even know existed. It causes your knees to buckle. It causes you to cry out in desperation on the one hand and then literally takes your breath away in the, in the next. Have you ever been there? You've wanted something so deep down in your soul that your very body could feel it. For your prodigal child to come back, for your spouse to return, for a loved one's salvation, for the mending of a broken relationship, for the grief to end after a death, your own health to be restored, your own longing for a child or a spouse, your unemployment status to change. You need God to come now because the pain is too hard to bear. And what happens when your pain is actually caused by God? The Bible clearly states in verses five and six that the Lord closed up her womb. Through no fault of her own, she was barren. This was the will of God. Now this can be a hard pill to swallow. 
that the Lord could cause us to endure so much pain. King Solomon reminds us in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 14, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of the of adversity, consider God has made one as well as the other. And Job, after losing his wealth, his children, and his failing health, tells his wife who demands he curse God and die. He says, shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? We don't like to admit it. But sometimes God puts us in these difficult situations. While God is not the author of evil, sometimes he not just allows something to happen, but actually affirmatively puts it in place. But we must learn to accept both those things that thrill us and those things that cause us great pain from God, because we know that if it comes from God, it is wrapped in love and is one of the all things that work together for the good of God for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. The purpose of Hannah's barrenness was not to put her through undue harm. There was a purpose that God would fulfill through her, and not just for her, but for the entire nation of Israel. Hannah was in a situation that was created by God and that only God could intervene to change. So what do you do when you've been living with such pain for so long? What do you do when you're waiting? How do you handle it when you're in such soulful agony? Hannah shows us how to have heroic faith in the face of heartache and waiting. To have heroic faith in the face of heartache and waiting, first we must stand up. Stand up. Hannah had a determined spirit and she stands up in the midst of her pain. Verse nine says, once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. If you have a, a paper Bible, Underline that. Hannah stood up. If you're using an app, underline it. Hannah stood up. Hannah and her family had traveled from Ephraim, their home, to Shiloh, where they would worship the Lord. As always, Peninnah had been teasing her. Part of the religious ceremonies included sacrifice of sacrificial animals. Then there would be this large, lavish meal that included portions of the slain animals. Elkanah had given Hannah a double portion out of the meat, out of his love for her. Hannah probably thought he pitied her. But rather than wallow in her sadness and heartache, Hannah stands up. Her standing is as much metaphorical as it is actual. She stands up to go to the sanctuary, but more than that, she determines in her spirit that she would stand up. She determines that she will not sit in her misery. In spite of or perhaps because of her infertility, Hannah is a strong woman of faith. Hannah had suffered enough that it had strengthened her resolve. Her endurance had been tested by the years of her suffering and waiting, and she was the stronger for it. In fact, she personifies Paul when he will later write in Romans 5, we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. She had suffered because of her condition, and yet she would not let her suffering defeat her. Her suffering produced in her a perseverance that demanded that she would not give up hope. She would not let her condition defeat her. This is where her faith was tested. Her faith was proven in her pain. I believe somebody needs to hear that message today. Some of you are going through some very horrible situations, even before COVID or anything else. You're battling cancer or some other debilitating disease. You're wrestling with an unfulfilled dream. You've been praying for a spouse or a child to come. You've been, your marriage might be in shambles. It's been over a year and you're still unemployed, but Hannah shows up that we cannot give up. The enemy would want us to sit in despair. The enemy would want us to shut ourselves in, get under the covers and never leave the house again. The enemy would want us to give up on God. Hannah could have stayed in her misery, and I'm sure those around her would have understood. But that's not what Hannah does. Hannah refuses to be defeated. She stands up. And in standing up, she reminds us that we can stand up too. And standing up might actually mean standing up, getting out of bed, taking a shower, and combing your hair instead of laying in bed crying. Standing up might mean seeking out counseling because you realize you cannot handle this situation on your own anymore. Standing up might mean if you feel comfortable going out and volunteering your time rather than wallowing in self-pity. 
Standing up might look differently for each one of us, but Hannah shows us that we must stand up. We must stand up out of despair and self-pity. Hannah demonstrates for us that even in the midst of heartache, our faith demands that we stand up. Second, Hannah shows us that we demonstrate heroic faith when we pour out our soul to the Lord. We pour out our soul to the Lord through prayer. Hannah presented herself and her concerns to the Lord. Verses 10 through 16 say, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been here praying out of my great anguish and grief. Hannah stands up in the midst of her sorrow with a mission to pour out her soul to the Lord. Now, this may not seem incredible for us today, but it was truly groundbreaking at that time. No other woman is mentioned going to the Lord's house to pray in the Old Testament. Remember, during this time, it was the men who brought the sacrifices and the men were the priests who prayed. But here is this woman, desperate to have her concerns made to the Lord, so so. So she shrugs off social conformity and goes where she knows the Lord's presence dwells. The relief she needed from the pain she suffered could not come from another human being. It required divine intervention. She sought relief only from God. Sometimes we run around to everyone except God. And now with social media, it's so easy to just tweet or, or put on Facebook how we're feeling. But going to your friends is never a substitute for going for God, going to God. Hannah prayed so fervently that Eli thought she was drunk. She was so focused on God and her pain so deep that it didn't matter who was around her and it didn't matter what anyone else thought. She needed to have her prayers heard by her father. She needed to cry out to the Lord. She was pouring out her soul to the Lord. The kind of pain Hannah endured could only be cured by divine intervention. So she retreats to a place with only her and God. No one but God can hear this prayer. And this is why I personally love Hannah so much. She is audacious and focused. She demonstrates a courage that comes from her desperation. She demonstrates a confidence that comes from knowing that only God can handle her pain. She understood that the Lord Almighty is the all powerful deliverer of those in distress, including her. The ability to pour out your soul to the Lord, to pay, to pray through the pain, to pray through the bitterness, to pray through the distress and the disappointment, to pray through the waiting. That's powerful faith. That's mature faith. That's heroic faith. It's faithful stubbornness. Despite the odds, despite what others may think, despite even what it looks like, you keep going. That's endurance. Nowadays, we call it grit. Grit is what researchers say separates the successful from those who are less successful. Can you keep going? Can you keep fighting? Can you keep praying? The ability to persevere over the long haul is what makes Hannah such a hero of faith for us. She is able to remain faithful to God in the midst of her own enduring heartache and waiting. We need some people with perseverance, some people with some grit. Some of us have more endurance with our exercise routine than we have with our faith. But some of the things you're going through in your life are not going to be resolved in five days or five minutes or even five years. God wants to mature us through these situations, but we have to be able to remain strong, to dig down deep and keep praying and keep serving and keep believing. You have to be able to say, I'm going all the way with you, God. 
You have to believe his word that says they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like as an eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It is in the praying, in the pouring out of your soul in the presence of God that our strength is renewed. This is what Hannah's prayer demonstrates. Have you ever poured out your soul to the Lord? Have you ever been so focused on hearing what your and hearing on God hearing your petition that it didn't matter what else was going on at the time? I think sometimes we become so sophisticated in our prayers that we don't get dirty and messy with them anymore. God hears all our prayers, even the ones that are not so polite. It's okay. God can handle it. And if you've ever been in enough pain and you know that God is the only one that can ease that pain, you don't care what it sounds like. You don't care because you are expressing your raw emotions to your loving father. Sometimes you have to break protocol and sometimes you have to break form because that is what your pain requires. I met some wonderful people when I was in seminary. And one of them was Ed Adams. Ed was a year ahead of me in school and was just full of wisdom and knowledge beyond his years. He's one of those people who knew when he was like a little kid that he wanted to be a preacher. And so he always just just had this um, pastoral care about him. In my first year, Ed's second year, Ed was diagnosed with a brain tumor and it was malignant. Me and all of his friends rallied beside him and his wife as best we could. We prayed and we prayed. We visited and we sent meals. The day of his first surgery, we set up a 24 hour prayer line and each hour a different person was assigned to pray. He was able to come back to school after the surgery, but things became progressively worse for him. The cancer appeared in other places and spread. In my third year, we realized that things were not going well and we organized a school-wide prayer service for him. I would like to say that this was a nice, dignified service, but it was not. The only way I can describe it is how my grandmother would say that we tarried before the Lord. We stayed and we prayed. We cried out to the Lord. I cried and I prayed. I wailed on the author of Duke's prestigious Goodson Chapel. Why? Because the pain was that deep. My friend was dying and only God could intervene. Hannah is our foremother in faith who shows us what it means to pour out our souls before the Lord, confident that the Lord will hear our cry. But for those of you who are not that expressive and prefer to be a bit quieter, take heart. Hannah's prayer was actually a silent prayer. Yet it was still considered unusual for the time. During this time, prayers were actually said aloud. So Hannah's desperate personal prayer with her lips moving, but otherwise her being silent, probably did look crazy. Was she talking to herself? Was she drunk? No. It was a desperate personal prayer. It was so unusual that Eli was skeptical. It was so powerful, however, that it remains a model for prayer for Jews even today. Her prayer is the source of why their primary prayers are said in a whisper. Hannah demonstrates a boldness even in her posture of prayer because she knows that only God can deliver her from her pain. But it's not just the mode of prayer, but the content of Hannah's prayer that is important. She models submission and sacrifice when she makes her vow to God. Hannah calls herself a servant before the Lord. She belongs to him. But she understands God's sovereignty over her life. She understands that her relationship with God is not just about taking, but about giving as well. She's willing to give up what she wants the most, a son, and return him back to the Lord as a willing sacrifice. Hannah makes an incredible vow to the Lord. The very thing she loves the most, she agrees to give up. Now, what Hannah does is not like what we tend to do. We tend to say things like, God, if you would just help me get this new job, I'll go to church every Sunday. Or perhaps less frivolous, Lord, if you get me through this, I will never ask you for anything else again. Hannah's vow is sincere. She keeps her vow. She will bring Samuel to Eli after Samuel is weaned around three years old 
and leave him with Eli so that he can be raised to fully serve the Lord all the days of his life. Hannah's vow shows us that she has rightly ordered her life. She doesn't make her desire for her son an idol. Serving the Lord was her primary aim, so her son would not be for her own benefit or enjoyment, but would be for the Lord. She knew that if granted, her son would not be for her. Nothing belonged to her. He would belong to the Lord. Hannah submitted her dream for a son to the Lord, and as desperately as she wanted him, she was willing to sacrifice him back for the Lord. And that's what makes her a heroic woman of faith. And let's be honest. Sometimes we pour out our soul, cry more tears than we knew we had, and God does not grant our request. We get frustrated and we say, God did not answer my prayer. That's not true. He did. He just didn't give us the response we had hoped for. But God always answers our prayers, either with a yes or a no or a not yet. So often we go into prayer wanting an outcome and then we become disappointed with God and lose faith when he doesn't do what we want him to do. I've prayed for people to be healed and some were like my uncle William, whose colon cancer is gone. And some found their healing in heaven, like my mother. I've prayed for situations to change and sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't. It can be hard and confusing. I know how much you all prayed for Pastor Josh and his family over the last few weeks. We were praying with you at Metro. I know some of you are confused and disappointed. We are too. Even Jesus prayed that the cup would be taken from him, but God said no. But the key to Jesus's prayer and to our prayer is not our will, but yours be done. And even if we don't understand it, and even if we don't agree, if we hold on to God long enough, we will learn to trust him even in our disappointment. Because you see, that's when we're transformed in the process, when we get to grow deeper in our relationship with God. He still loves you and he has not failed you. Don't let the fear of a possible no or disappointment about a previous no keep you out of relationship with God. There is more to God than answering our prayer requests. It's when he shows up for us, even when he doesn't do what we want him to. Hannah didn't know what the outcome would be, but that did not keep her from going to the Lord. The night before my friend Ed's first surgery, a few friends came to visit him in the hospital. And in the midst of our conversation, Ed taught me so much about heroic faith. He said, I now understand what it means for Job to have never cursed God. What he meant was that when you're in seminary training to serve God in ministry and when your wife is pregnant with your child and when you're facing surgery because you have a malignant tumor on your brain, it makes logical sense for you to want to curse God. But his faith demanded more. Our faith demands more. That we stand up. We stand up to the fear and we stand up to the doubts the enemy tries to plant in our hearts and in our minds, and we trust God. From the moment we found out about Ed's diagnosis, we prayed for him. But sadly, it was not God's will, and he took him home on October 19th, 2011. We were crushed and heartbroken, and we could have turned away from God. We had done everything we knew how to do, but we didn't because God had still been gracious to Ed. Ed lived to see his daughter born and his daughter gave him such joy, even in the midst of all of his pain. And I know where Ed is and believe me, he's doing much better than we are right now. And God was and is still God. And Jesus is still on the throne. 
and and me and my friends, all of us, we continue to worship God and we continue to serve God and all of us continue to lift up the name of God because our hope and our faith is not in the prayers we prayed, but in the God we serve, the God who loves us. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He is the great redeemer and he will make all things new, even if we don't see how. So we, we demonstrate heroic faith in times of heartache and in times of waiting when we stand up and when we pour our souls out to the Lord. And finally, even when we worship, Hannah teaches us to worship even in the midst of waiting. Verses 17 through 20 say, Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel saying, because I asked the Lord for him. When Hannah finishes praying, she worships God. She hears from Eli, she lifts up her head, she leaves and she worships. Did you notice that there was no change in Hannah's situation when she finishes praying? Yes, Eli had pronounced a blessing over her, but there was no guarantee. God had not told her that she would become pregnant. She walked away still in her barren condition. Yet she lifts up her head, eats and worships. Her worship came before she became pregnant. And, and gave birth to a son. Her praises before the Lord came before she ever holds a baby boy in her arms. Why? Because God is still God. And if Hannah never had a baby, God is still God. And if God never grants the request on your heart, do you know why you still praise him? Because God is still God. Yes, we praise him because he answers prayers, but even more so, we praise him because he is Lord. We praise him because he is sovereign. We praise him because he is holy and he is mighty because his love is steadfast and his grace is far reaching. We praise him because he is faithful even when we are faithless. We praise him because he is the almighty one. We praise him because he sent his son Jesus just for us. Our worship of God is not dependent upon our circumstances. It's not even dependent upon our mood. All of those things change daily, if not moment by moment, but God is a constant. He is our constant. That's why our worship can be constant. No matter what is going on in our lives, God remains the same. And Hannah knew this. Hannah laid her request before the Lord and she left God to do what God will do. Her role, to worship. I can imagine her coming into the sanctuary, weighed down with her grief and her sorrow, crying and praying to the Lord, but leaving light and jovial with a spring in her step. She won a spiritual victory through her labor of tears and prayers. The rest was up to God. As the psalmist reminds us, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. In leaving the sanctuary hope-filled, Hannah demonstrates great faith. Do you realize that the choice to smile in the midst of great distress or sadness or grief or waiting is a sign of faith? It is a sign of resistance to the devil. It says to your heart and it says to the world that circumstances will not demonstrate, will not determine my countenance. My situation will not overwhelm me to the point of despair. Hannah chose to put her faith in God. She chose to not let her infertility keep her from trusting God. This is why she can eat. She had been depressed so much so that she could not eat. But now, having left the presence of the Lord, having poured out her heart to the Lord and knowing that the Lord has heard her, now she lifts up her head. She dries the tears from her face. She eats and she worships. She turned her sorrow into praise. When we find ourselves in desperate situations, those are not the times to give up on God. 
Not at all. Those are the times we press in even more. We stand up in faith, we pray, and we worship. The enemy wants nothing more than for us to give up on God, for us to fixate so much on our conditions that we cannot even see God. But don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big God is. Worship the Lord, Hannah teaches us. And worship doesn't mean you have to be gathered together. We, we can't do that right now. Worship God on your own. Play mu worship music on your own. Tell God how much you love him on your own. You don't need a crowd. You are before an audience of one. Worship the Lord. Whether you've been waiting five minutes or you've been waiting five years, worship the Lord. The Bible doesn't tell us how long Hannah had to wait for her situation to change. The Bible doesn't tell us how many years she had been married and still without a child. It just says, in the course of time. But I can imagine it had been quite a while. Perhaps she and Elkanah had been married several years before she realized her infertility. Elkanah then took on another wife who could give him children. Hannah could have suffered from infertility for 15, 20 years or more. We had no idea. But we know she had to wait and she had to wait a while. But in that wait, she worshiped. Hannah did not lose faith in God and she did not lose sight of God in the midst of her heartache. She worshiped. And in the course of time, the Bible says God remembered her and gave her a son. When the Bible says that the Lord remembered Hannah, it doesn't mean that God had previously forgotten about her. No, it's, it's really more a signal for us, the reader, that God is about to act. God is about to move on behalf of someone. And here he does. And God gives her not just a son, but marks her in Jewish history. Her story is still read by observant Jews on Rosh Hashanah. During the day of remembrance, her story is a reminder that God remembered the Jewish people and he remembers us. Our apparent hopelessness is not a barrier to God's work in our lives. What we consider hopelessness is an opportunity for us to trust God more. But let's be clear. The purpose of standing up in the face of heartache, of praying, of worshiping, is not to manipulate God into doing what we want him to do. In all of these things, we are submitting ourselves to God and to God's will. We are building our faith and our endurance. We are moving into deeper relationship with God. Hannah shows us the transformative power of standing up and pouring out our souls before the Lord because it leads to worship and our focus recentered on God. I know there are so many of you who are waiting for something, who are hurting right now, but don't give up. Let Hannah encourage you. Stand up, keep praying, wipe your eyes and worship our Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, we know that in this life, we will s see heartache and pain, and we will have to wait for some things, Lord God. And so God, I pray for my brother and my sister, wherever they are, God. I pray for those who are waiting. I pray for those who are heartbroken. God, I pray that you might encourage their hearts to stand up. To stand up in their spirits, to stand up in their minds, to not give up on you, God. God, I pray that they might pour out their souls to you, Lord. That they might trust that you will hear their cries and that you will come and see about them that you will be with them. And God, I pray that you will encourage our hearts to worship you even in the midst of the waiting, even in the midst of the heartache, God, because it's in the standing up and it's in the pouring out of our souls and it's in the worshiping God that we get to experience more and more of you. So God, help us to persevere, help us to endure, help us to have a heroic faith that draws us closer to you, God, that allows us to inspire others and that gives us the power to help change this world, oh God. Lord God, we trust you and we love you. 
God, for all those who are struggling. As the father said about his son, God, we believe, but help our unbelief. Come and meet us where we're at, Lord God, wherever that is, and draw us closer to you. It is through your son, Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Take me back to the garden Lead me back to the moment I heard your voice Take me back to communion Lead me back to the moment I saw your face And it was oh so simple it was easy to love and no space between us it was easy to trust cause you are closer closer than my skin Oh, 
Jesus, immediately after you say that sentence, you say to your disciples, you are my friends if you do my commandments. No longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. Jesus, those words to us are as precious as life itself because you foretold how you would lay down your very life for us and how because of that love, that greatest love that was ever known, Lord, that no matter what happens, Lord, that we have a covenant secured in your name, in your blood, in your body that was broken for us. And so, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I pray that if we wander, Lord, if we wander from this garden of intimacy or this place of abiding in you, of loving you and loving others, Father, I pray that you would bring us back. Lord, prune us. Prune the areas that aren't bearing fruit. Prune the areas that do bear fruit so they can bear even more fruit. God, we thank you for your grace, your immeasurable uh, mercy. God, I pray that you would help us remember you in all the ways that we, um, we give thanks for the good things and even that we have faith in the bad. Thank you, Lord. We love you, God. Jesus, thank you for loving us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. See you guys next week.
turn this into a prayer tonight over our nation, over our cities. Come awaken your people. Come awaken.